So welcome, welcome to our uh, biobanking uh, workshop organized by the Global Seaweed Coalition. My name is Adrian Vincent, and I would have the pleasure to uh, kick off this meeting and then help facilitate some of the breakout discussions. I think we have uh, sent you many emails individually and collectively, but for us, it was really uh, a hotter and hotter topic that we identified through the Global Seaweed Coalition. The seaweed biobanking one is uh, might be a critical enabler from a scientific perspective, from a, almost an ethical and philosophical, per philosophical perspective in terms of uh, cataloging and preserving species that are under massive threat from, uh, from climate change and other stressors, uh, but also that could be a key unlocker and a key enabler to, uh, to help spur the seaweed revolution that is close to the heart of uh, the mission of the Global Seaweed Coalition. So we are really happy. Thank you so much. You are the best experts in the world on this topic. So thank you so much for the, joining us to share your various perspectives and the great work you are doing in your respective uh, institutions and geographies. And the, the objective of today is really to first learn from one another and understand what is happening in, in other places in the world. Uh, and so for that, we will have a number of, uh, of presentations that it's about taking stock and getting inspirations. Uh, and then we'll move to a more brainstorming part where we will collectively discuss how can we connect some dots a bit better? How can we identify synergies? And uh, how can this global momentum of individual initiative be uh, leveraged to, uh, to better share best practices, share methodologies, and share resources uh, to, to go even faster on the bio banking project? So looking now at the agenda, more detail, more detailed agenda. So I'll give you a quick introduction of uh, the Global Seaweed Coalition for those who are not fully familiar with this initiative. And, uh, and then my, my dear colleague Philippe Potin will present the scientific council of, uh, of the coalition and wh what we do and how this workshop is, uh, I think, is a, is a key example of the work being led by this council. And then, as I was teasing you, we will, uh, we will start with the first series of, uh, of speeches to get inspired and, and learn what is happening uh, in other species, in other, in other crops with the Global Crop Diversity Trust, but, and then in, other, in, in a number of geographies, Korea, Southeast Asia, and Europe. We'll have then 10 minutes of Q&A uh, with the speakers and take a 10-minute bio break. And we'll then come back to the virtual room to have a second part of taking stock and getting inspired, traveling to other geographies this time, going to Africa, and then to the US, but to the US East Coast and the US West Coast. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this inspiration session with another Q&A with the second panel. And then it will really be about leveraging your, uh, your brains and your ideas to uh, explore how from a protocol um, a protocol perspective, a technology perspective, a global platform perspective, and an ethics and governance perspective, how can we better work together, better connect the dots and identify uh, ideas for further collaboration that could be facilitated by the Global Seaweed Coalition. Uh, each of these breakouts, so these breakouts will run in parallel, so you will be, uh, uh, I think, automatically allocated to, uh, to one area. We've tried to mix the profiles and to build on your strengths. Hopefully you will be satisfied with the, the, the way we have allocated you. But anyway, after those breakouts, there will be a collective report back session where uh, we learn about what has been discussed in each group. And, and we'll wrap up uh, the workshop with some closing remarks from uh, our colleagues. Uh, is it Jan Probert, Melanie, I'm not mistaken? Ian Probert, yes. Yeah, exactly. So Ian Probert, who is uh, from, uh, on one hand, from the CNRS at the Station Biologique de Roscoff, but also an active member of the European Network and, uh, and Initiative EMBRC, who is going to share his perspectives. And with that, we'll wrap up this long workshop, uh, hopefully uh, all, all still very energized, if not even more energized by, by the discussions. So now moving to the quick introduction of the Global Seaweed Coalition. So as a reminder, the Global Seaweed Coalition, born in 2021, and, and its first name was the Safe Seaweed Coalition, but it has been rebranded last year, is a global partnership established to develop, to support the safe and sustainable scale-up of the seaweed sector grounded in science. And I think this uh, last part of the mission statement is, uh, is, is really well illustrated today. We want to help advocate for the seaweed agenda, to help the seaweed players develop in a sustainable way, but 
science being really front and center in this journey. Um, in terms of uh, core partnerships and core partners behind the, the coalition, uh, it has been initiated by uh, uh, with the support of the Lord Register Foundation, and it's now hosted, the Secretariat is hosted by the UN Global Compact. Uh, and since the beginning, the CNRS, the French CNRS, National Research Center, has been the, the scientific partner uh, facilitating, in particular, the, the scientific council. Next slide. So quick word about our membership. So as of today, we have almost 1,200 members representing uh, 90 countries globally. And the idea is that this coalition is really actively engaging with the members. So uh, we organized a number of, uh, of uh, virtual roundtables with them in the past years to make sure that the members had a say on the priorities of the coalition, on the priorities of the sector. Uh, we regularly collect feedback on uh, what should be our priorities and where we should put our efforts. Um, and then just a word to, to remind you that uh, all the members, and if you are not members yet, by the way, it's super easy and free. You can just go to, to our website, uh, globalseawithcoalition.com, as Dean, I'm listening to you to, to check if I'm right, or you can .org. maybe... .org. Dot .org. Dot .org. But maybe put it in the chat, uh, as Dean, already with the link to uh, register as a new member for those who are not, uh, not members yet. Um, and by becoming a member, that means that uh, you agree with the Seawood Revolution Manifesto that uh, was announced uh, back in the middle of the pandemic, I think in 2020, as a kind of uh, of call for action to to help develop this industry. Next slide. So a quick reminder of uh, of the core activities of the coalition structured against four action pillars. The first the first one is about funding, and so here, uh, if I if I simplify our actions, on one hand there is direct funding, and so every year. Uh, we organize a call for proposal and the winners receive a grant of uh, roughly 40 to 50,000 euros uh, to usually develop uh, science and knowledge and innovation in, a, in an open, open access way. Uh, but then there is also an indirect way where we actively engage with the investment community. Uh, so a lot of private investment funds, but also public investment funds who ask us how can they play in the seaweed world and we are trying to help them navigate and enter the space so, so private capital can uh, more easily enter uh, the industry. Second pillar about advocacy, I think this is really the bread and butter of this coalition. And I'm sure most of you know our uh, ambassador, uh, Vincent Dumezel, who is uh, through his books, talks, TED Talks, and so on, is uh, actively uh, holding the, the seaweed flag and trying to uh, um, break a bit the or go outside of our seaweed echo chamber to, to mobilize a large community uh, against our uh, support our agenda. And for instance, this week he's in the Uni United Nations Environmental Assembly. So talking with lots of country delegations to a private sector, public sector to uh, make sure that seaweed is on their map. But I'm with Sire you, uh, Adwin. Ah, oh, Vincent, well. you're there. Yeah, Vincent. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Hello. you see, I speak, I speak highly of you when I don't. Oh, yeah, I yeah, I appreciate that. that. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, science and technology. So this is really like, uh, I think this workshop is an illustration of that. So through our scientific committee, we identify a number of uh, topics where we believe that sharing knowledge can make a difference. And so we, are, we have organized already a series of webinars on a number of hot topics like uh, seaweed and carbon, seaweed and pests and disease. Um, and I think we have lots of other webinars planned for the rest of the year, always inviting uh, serious experts from di diverse backgrounds to uh, really help the broader civic community have uh, access to the latest knowledge on those hot topics. Uh, and next to that, there is also the scientific committee, but uh, the Philippe will, will come back to that in a minute. And finally, policy. We are also and leveraging our hosting with the UN uh, uh, Global Compact also actively uh, engaging with policymakers, be it at the international level, so working hand in hand with UNEP, for instance, on a number of topics, with FAO, uh, but also uh, in a more opportunity uh, ad hoc way, opportunistic ad hoc way. Uh, we also engage with a number of uh, of uh, national authorities. So, for instance, uh, working with France, we released yesterday their national roadmap for seaweed development. Um, working with some African countries and usually the ones where we have granted projects uh, and also at a, at a more uh, 
continental level, uh, having really close ties with the European Commission, who is uh, championing the seaweed agenda with their uh, EU algae initiative. And so I think with that, I'm, I'm wrapping up my uh, general introduction to the coalition and, and giving the floor to my colleague uh, Philippe Potin, uh, emeritus, uh, or not emeritus yet, but uh, very senior uh, researcher and uh, head of research at uh, CNRS in Roscoff and chief scientific officer, let's call it like that, for the uh, for the Global Seaweed Coalition. Philippe, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrien, and thank you to all of you to, for attending this uh, workshop, uh, which is, of, of course, uh, as Adrien was mentioning, an important action uh, in the context of uh, the work of our, our new scientific councils, which was, in fact, launched uh, when we um, uh, rebranded uh, the Safe Seaweed Coalition to the Global Seaweed Coalition. We decided also to, to change a bit the governing bodies of uh, the, the coalition and to really create a, a fully independent scientific council for the coalition to really uh, be able to, con to, to continue uh, uh, to um, uh, develop action for, for, for the coalitions, which will be uh, science grounded. So um, we have uh, assembled a, a council of uh, now 15 scientists from uh, all over the world. Where you have uh, some of the, the logos of the, the organization which are represented in the, our scientific council and which are providing uh, their different uh, expertise and visions for the, the, um, the development of the civil sectors based on their scientific expertise. So the, the, these scientists are really contributing to uh, we provide ideas and uh, suggestions for organizing the um, the, 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 the animation of uh, the coalition in terms of uh, organization of workshops, as it was uh, stressed by by uh, Adrien uh, previously. So we had very stimulating uh, workshop already, which are still available uh, on YouTube uh, on our YouTube channels. Uh, and um, of course, we are planning uh, additional workshops. But uh, of course, this uh, today workshop is, is quite special. Uh, it will uh, um, be a, a webinar with uh, uh, only a, a talk. We, you will contribute to all together to 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 the. Um, the, the the content of uh, the, this uh, workshop and uh, provide very important um, inputs for 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 the topic uh, of today, which is uh, the seaweed biobanking. Uh, of course, uh, our scientific um, council members are are present in uh, different areas in the the, the, the field of uh, seaweed research, and they are contributing to many scientific. Uh, uh, conferences and forums, and they are uh, providing uh, really uh, a possibility to 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 feed the the, the activities of uh, um, of the, the coalition by by their own experiences. So next slide. And so for the the, the scientific uh, leadership of uh, the coalition, of course, uh, it's very important to uh, uh, in fact um, orientate uh, the the possibility of uh, the the action. Of uh, the coalition towards uh, some uh, projects uh, on support uh, support of a project by uh, specific uh, funding, which uh, were contributed by Solid Research Foundation uh, funding during the last uh, two years, and uh, we are at the moment in the, in the process of uh, a specific call uh, for proposals, uh, which will uh, allow to, uh, to 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 grant uh, uh, at least seven to nine uh, new projects, uh, in addition with the 25 uh, projects which were already supported by the um, Global Civic Coalition. So uh, the, 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 the topics for, for this, these calls are, are, of course, related to some scientific and technological uh, aspects and related uh, a lot to the, um, the, 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 um, the concept of uh, safety for, for, for the seaweed sector, including, of course, the food and consumer safety, but also stressing the, 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 all the dimension of uh, environmental safety for the development of, uh, of the seaweed sector, uh, of course, to protect uh, the, the 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 activity, but also to protect to 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 keep uh, uh, the environment uh, um, in which uh, the activities are, are developing safe. We are also uh, developing uh, some um, uh, um, uh, occupational and health safety aspects, which are very important. In addition, with all all all, all these aspects, but uh, of course, the the scientific. Uh, 
uh, dimension of uh, the coalition uh, is not uh, only uh, limited to safety. Uh, it, uh, it is an important uh, uh, concept for to federate, in fact, the actions. And this is why we, uh, we have stressed uh, all the, 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 this concept uh, since the beginning, uh, together, of course, with uh, our funder, uh, the Lloyd Race of Foundations. So we have already uh, spent uh, 1.2 million of uh, euros for which were delivered to the projects uh, which were funded in 26 countries but we will uh, continue and we hope uh, that in the future also uh, through the the, the the contribution of the scientific council we will uh, evolve the project to possibly larger initiative which will increase the scientific uh, cooperation uh, worldwide uh, to uh, speed the transfer of uh, technology or or, or concepts uh, for the seaweed industry so I will not say much more, except that, uh, of course, uh, uh, presently uh, in the scientific concept, we are also working very hard to provide um, the possibility of uh, giving some advice uh, from a scientific perspective to drive the, the development of the civil sector and how it could be scaled up. So uh, we are planning to deliver this this year um, uh, a position or or. or a white paper from uh, our scientific council, and uh, that will be uh, one of the activity of uh, in the coming uh, weeks. So thank you very much for your attention. Melanie, I, I give you the, the, the floor to continue to present uh, some uh, scientific and technological uh, aspects of development, which are in fact related to the topic of the, 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 the workshop today. Thank you, Philippe, and uh, greetings, everyone. So, yeah, I'm Melanie Kreft, a scientific officer working closely with uh, Philippe Potan. So, among the projects that uh, we found uh, through our call for proposal, there are a couple that are related to biobanking. One, uh, so, they will be most of them presented today. And the first one I would like to introduce is Secure Future, uh, led by uh, Dr. Roleda in the Philippines with the objective to select uh, LC ocumatories, and especially Capaficus strains that are robust and disease-free. And this is to preserve the genetic diversity of, uh, of these uh, particular species because cultivation has been done a lot through reproduct reproductive, uh, vegetative reproduction and uh, the loss of uh, part of this biodiversity. So he will share with you how he collected more than 500 strains uh, present currently in his laboratory, uh, with the objective also to production uh, to increase the production yield uh, with strains that are the richest in carrageenan. Then we also financed a project uh, in Europe this time um, in the Macaronesian Island. So if you don't know Macaronesian Island, are the Canary and Azores Island. Uh, which is a merge of uh, the Spanish bank and the Bank of Algae of the Azores. So through the, through the funding of the coalition, the, it allowed them to uh, train more scientific and technical staff to um, run a bioprospecting campaign, um, to do genetic identification and to promote their work uh, to the scientific community, but also to a uh, company in the seaweed field. And then uh, the, we also financed the sea strain workshop, so uh, that most of you must be aware of because you were part of it uh, last year. Um, the objective was to create a European-wide strategy here to prevent uh, the loss of uh, diversity and to preserve the genetic seaweed resource. And so led by uh, Dr. Laurie Hoffman and her team that are present uh, in, in the in this workshop. Uh, so the objective was to create a seaweed biobank network at a European level. So that's what we are seeking to do also today, but at a global level, um, to build a database of seaweed strains present uh, uh, in a private and public collection in Europe. So there is a glance of the map uh, that uh, Laurie has worked uh, on uh, to locate uh, where are the different seaweed strain uh, collected in the European uh, collection. And finally, to deliver an opinion paper uh, on developing a strategy for safeguarding seaweed genetic resources in Europe. Uh, we also, uh, through, through those calls for proposal, um, we also finance uh, projects that are not uh, ex 
pure biobanking, but that are related to it um, to identify, isolate, and cultivate seaweed. One of them is uh, basilisk, which is biobanking of uh, pests and diseases um, in Chile. Uh, and there is also a, a biobank that is not mentioned here, but uh, Dr. Sylvain Forgeron, present today also, I will be able to, to talk you through uh, the biobank of Gracilaria species in, um, in uh, Chile. And uh, ocean farmer uh, that is not uh, running biobanking exactly, but that are isolating and cultivating a comatoid in, Maga in Madagascar to improve uh, strain robustness for, um, for cultivation. So we'll get a presentation also today. So we will move on now to our first session where we will have a, a glance of um, the crop uh, diversity uh, bank. Um, but before we, and then um, traveling to uh, Southeast Asia and Korea, but before we are going to this session, I would like to take a, a group picture of uh, this uh, working session. And uh, Celia Montureux, our communication intern, will take the picture. So please um, all turn on your camera if you, if you like. Um, you need to stop sharing your screen, Melanie. Yeah. Okay, smile. Lovely. Super, thank you, Celia. Beautiful smile. Okay, so I'm now welcoming our first guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Smith, Executive Director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust. So this is the only organization um, in the world that focuses on building and supporting a global system of gene banks for the conservation of crop diversity. So outside of the, of the seaweed field, but good to take inspiration of. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, yeah, and hello everybody. Uh, for those who do not uh, know me yet, I'm Stefan, uh, Stefan Schmitz, the executive director of the Global Crop Diversity Trust. Um, or Crop Trust for sure. The Crop Trust has been established uh, 20 years ago and operates un, in, within the framework of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. This is quite important. This is for, for us the, 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 the framework and uh, the overarching yeah, uh, legal uh, body under which we uh, oper uh, operate. I will come back to this uh, uh, later. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Just without further ado, I get uh, I will go into it and hope I can. And can inspire you a little bit. I think uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the the landscape we are working in, the challenges, the landscape of challenges is almost uh, the same. We are all aware of, no need to go into detail. This uh, global food insecurity is a main challenge uh, for us in the middle of uh, a lot of challenges with climate change, growth with biodiversity loss pandemic and so on uh, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, so why crop diversity? What is our starting point? A very, very quick uh, um, a round of introduction here. Next slide, please. Um, crop diversity ticks a lot of developmental uh, boxes. So the plant genetic resources, um, the rationale, why collect them, why conserve them, why use them, uh, very important. Uh, it addresses climate uh, uh, climate resilience. Um, uh, it is more resource efficiency uh, with crop diversity. Uh, we can aim as... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, less, uh, less perishable uh, crops, higher yielding crops, more diverse cultivation, and last, last but not least, uh, more nutritious crops. Next, next slide, please. So um, with that, um, diversity exists between different uh, crop species, as you see here. Next slide, please. Um, and this is starting from various centers of origin, origins around the world, origins and primary regions of the world. This is a very, very broad landscape of the diversity of agricultural crops. Next slide, please. 
um, uh, next, yes, we have, you, you can, yes, yes, that's it. Um, well, there we have a lot of well-researched uh, crops with professional breeding well used, less well-researched, little, little professional breeding, this is a middle um, category and a lot, a lot of unresearched uh, um, crops with no professional breeding under you uh, under use. This is a diversity on species level. Next slide, please. But diversity exists also within individual crop species. Next slide. And exists within individual crop varieties down to the genetic level. So diversity on many different levels, man-made, man, this is man-made um, um, uh, biodiversity um, created over the last uh, 12,000 years when man started to go into agriculture. Next slide, please. So, but why crop diversity is becoming more important, it's under growing threat. In the fields, Due to, yeah, you know, homogenization, standardization, industrialization of our agriculture, it is under threat in nature where the so-called crop wild relatives come from. And the crop wild relatives are likewise important when it comes to identifying genetic traits that helps us to breed new varieties um, um uh, with uh, uh, with certain properties uh, to be more resilient, more nutritious, um, uh, higher yielding, and so on. And they are under growing threat in gene banks that has been established uh, as long as those gene banks are not properly funded. And this is one of the concerns, and that is where the crop trust comes into play. Next slide, please. Um, the loss of biodiversity um, uh, of crops is real when looking what happened. This is an example taken from the US, what, uh, what happened within only one century. A lot of different uh, varieties in the market and 80 years later, so much reduced to only a very few uh, uh, only very, uh, very few crops. At least 90% of vegetable varieties, for example, in the US have gone extinct since 1903. Next slide. Yeah, this is how a properly financed, a properly funded, maintained um, um, a gene bank looks like, but that's Unfortunately, not the reality all over the world. Next slide, please. This is far closer to reality in many, many parts of the world. And that is exactly where the crop trust comes into, uh, uh, into play. We are a, a grant uh, provider uh, based on, the, on our uh, endowment fund, our own assets. So we are... Um, a grant provider um, for gene banks all over the world. So we are a secondary uh, uh, donor in our own. On the other hand, we are um, a, a technical cooperation provider uh, based on, uh, uh, on various uh, projects we are running. Next slide, please. So coming back to the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and agriculture. This is a global legal framework from the, for the conservation and use of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, and in particularly under uh, Article 15 of that treaty and in Annex 1, it is clearly laid out where the crop trust is, uh, is positioned. Next slide, please. Yeah, it is about conservation and making available um, for use. In the middle of that here in this uh, uh, blue box, the gene bank essential uh, operation, this is at the heart of our concern. It's about the long-term conservation, safety duplication, regeneration and characterization, the monitoring data management, acquisition and distribution, 
Um, this is uh, our main focus. You, you might add uh, plant health here uh, as well. So sometimes uh, plant health is uh, included in this one, uh, sometimes not, doesn't matter much. But there is a lot of other work that needs to be done. On the one hand, marked in red here, the continued efforts to collect threatened crop diversity in fields and crop wide relatives and natures, collect them and bring them to, uh, to, to gene banks. The upgrading and capacity building in gene banks is a constant uh, threat. But with all of that, of course, uh, we do not want to, to, to create uh, museums of uh, crop diversity. Uh, we need to make sure that everything in the gene banks is made available for researchers for breeders, but also directly to farmers when it comes to repatriation of, uh, of resources uh, to the fields. Next slide, please. Yeah, there are lots of um, uh, gene banks um, uh, uh, around the world. At FAO, there are more than 1,700. Uh, a reg registered one, many of them pretty small, but also some of them quite important. Next slide, please. So with the global gene bank, uh, uh, global system of gene bank conservation, it is our understanding the entirety of all the gene banks. And the whole is more than the sum of its part. And we, um, we, we see uh, four different uh, levels uh, here. On top is the so-called Svalbard Global Seed Vault. I will come back to this in a minute. This is a very unique um, uh, gene bank or seed bank as this only holds um, uh, safety duplicates. It is not a working collection where uh, where breeders and researchers constantly uh, withdraw material from. It is just a, a, a security backup. A second level are the international uh, uh, collections. 18 of them uh, are recognized uh, by FAO with a, uh, on specific status as international ones. Then the entirety of the national um, uh, uh, seed banks and national collections. And at the very bottom, lots of community collection that goes further down into conservation in fields, the so-called in situ conservation. And the Crop Trust promotes the collaboration among gene banks and their integration into a global system. We are pushing for increasing efficiency, effectiveness, effectiveness, working close together, and, and so on. Next slide, please. Yeah. Next. Yes. So as said, there are about 1,750 registered gene banks today. 130 of them are with more than 10,000 accessions or seed samples. 18 of them that uh, was international status, so was a second layer, with altogether a total of uh, 7.4 million accessions in all of those registered uh, seed banks. Uh, this is uh, growing and growing, 1.4 million more than 10 years ago, and approximately 1 million uh, today are considered to be unique. So anything else beyond the two uh, million need, uh, are to be considered as duplicate, redundancy, sometimes for good purposes, because we, um, we promote uh, and we encourage uh, uh, seed banks uh, to duplicate uh, uh, their uh, accessions and uh, uh, store them in a, sep uh, in, a in, se uh, in separate uh, places. Next slide, please. Uh, just uh, if you could uh, wrap up, Stefan, we, yes. because we yeah. are running yeah. a bit late. Okay, yeah, just, Already. okay, go, go through. Next slide, okay, international collections. Next slide, this is a Svalbard one. This is a safety duplicate. Next slide, yeah, ju just slides, go through it. Go through it. 
go through it. This is one of the boxes. This happened uh, uh, withdrawal after Syrian civil war, where the original ones had been destroyed, could be restored. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> for this presentation. Uh, so we might have questions, or so we'll ask questions in the Q&A later if there is any in the chat. Okay. So now we are going to, to travel to Korea with uh, Dr. Wong, senior researcher uh, based at the Seaweed Research Institute, which is part of the National Institute of Fishery and Science, and that belong to the Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries. So biobanking in Korea is uh, part of the national plan, and we should get inspired by uh, this pioneer country in uh, the seaweed uh, biobanking field. Dr. Dr. Wong, are you online to present? Yes. Hello. Hello is yours. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad to attend this wor workshop and hope we can have a fruitful result in the end. Um, okay, next, please. Um, with uh, CBD and Nagoya Protocol, the uh, Korean government has made sufficient preparation for conservation, management, utilization, and promotion of related industries on bioresources. Uh, the biological resources are essential for sustaining life, driving scientific and technological uh, innovations, and supporting eco, uh, so socio-economic development and preserving cultural heritage. Uh, the um, importance is the same uh, even in the marine and fisheries. Uh, next, please. Um, uh, one uh, interesting thing is, uh, in 2018, Korean government selected the top national strategic life research resources, including seaweed, pyrophia. Uh, these uh, life resources are specially managed and fostered by the government, and government support R&D for the related area. Uh, recently, uh, pyropia is a very uh, important industry in Korea, so uh, the export of pyropia is more and more increased in the, since uh, during the last decade. Next, please. Okay. Uh, the governance system of Korean uh, bioresources is implemented in accordance with the registration system on biological resource conservations. And according to the relative uh, ministries, uh, it has a biological field in charge and a corresponding biobanks. And next, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, for marine and fisheries resources, uh, our Ministry of Ocean and Fisheries uh, have related banks. CVT resources are uh, divided into marine and fisheries, and they are managed by MABIC and NIFS. The distinction between marine and fisheries is based on industrial use. Uh, for MABIC, uh, three out of uh, 20 banks are seaweed, and for NIFS, one of seven banks is a seaweed bank. Um, next, please. Uh, MABIC, uh, National Marine Biodiversity Institute of Korea, uh, is uh, specializing in the collection, preservation, research, utilization, uh, exhibition, and education on marine biological resources. Uh, they lead uh, 20 uh, biobanks of, of marine uh, biological resources. The annual budget for the banks is about uh, 20 million US dollars. Uh, most of the collections are run by universities. Uh, if the uh, owner or funds for a biobank are stopped, uh, Mavic uh, takes over the samples. And next, please. Uh, NIFS, uh, this is our institute. Uh, National Institute of Fisheries Science is uh, specializing in the marine and fisheries research for policy support and technological uh, dis uh, disseminations. Uh, NIFS uh, leads seven biobanks of fisheries biological resources, 
Uh, most of them uh, have resources in the form of DNA, but uh, the Seaweed Bank has resources in the in form of active collections. The annual budget for uh, banks is about 0.9 million US dollars. Uh, next, please. Uh, Seaweed Research Institute, uh, uh, this is a branch of NIPS, uh, is the only national uh, seaweed institution and conducts uh, research for seaweed resource management, breeding, aquaculture technology, and uh, government policy. Uh, we have 20 members. Uh, one of the important functions uh, is maintaining our seaweed culture collections. This is the curve uh, for the uh, use of seaweed resources by other research organizations. Uh, annual budget for the collections are uh, 60,000 US dollars with uh, five persons. Um, uh, but uh, this, uh, the salary for the, this uh, five persons is coming from another um, funds. Uh, we pres uh, preserved more than uh, 800 active collections of uh, 34 species. Uh, every year, uh, 50 species and uh, three, uh, more than uh, 300 species specimens uh, added. Especially, uh, Pyrophia was des uh, designated as one of the top uh, 10 uh, national strategic, uh, strategic bioresources uh, uh, in 2018. Therefore, systematic management is very important. Mm. Next, please. Um, uh, operating system of the seaweed culture collection uh, is from sampling, uh, isolation, registration to utilization. Uh, we have facilities and equipments to operate uh, effectively. Next, please. From uh, collection uh, to preservation, uh, it is important to secure a clean uh, isolation of single species. And next, please. The, um, and cultural medium is changed once a month and uh, three sets of backups are produced for uh, safety reasons. Next, please. Okay, uh, data management is conducted uh, on NIF's online site and external uh, organizations can apply for distribution or deposition through this site. But uh, unfortunately, uh, there's still no English service yet. Um, next, please. Uh, over the five, uh, past five years, uh, the universities uh, have been the most popular uh, consumer and pyrophia has been the most preference species. These seaweed resources are used not only for basic research, but also for various uh, areas such as breeding and aquaculture. Next, please. Uh, this is the uh, ethics for public when uh, we distribute seaweed resources, uh, but this is only ethics, not a mandatory obligation. Next, please. Uh, the seaweed, uh, seaweed collections are also used for exhibitions and uh, educational uh, activities. Um, next, please. Uh, this is conclusions. Uh, seaweed culture collection uh, is an important biobank uh, widely used in various research areas. We support free uh, distribution and deposition. And uh, domestic uh, platform for seaweed is very active and operational in Korea uh, by cooperation between Mavic and NIFS. Uh, a big risk recently uh, is the tendency to prefer extract biobanks with high added value according to government evaluation uh, based on quantitative indicators. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Always good to hear from Korea and Asia because you're not always present in workshop like that. Thank you, Dr. Wang. So we are now moving to the
the Philippines. Um, with uh, so this will be a video. Um, so that's uh, Dr. Michael Roleda, a professor at the Marine Science Institute at the University of Pil Philippines. So Dr. Roleda has led the project Secure Future, which I introduced, and the e-resilience e project, and built the unique biobank of Ecumatoid for the tropical region. So this biobank serves not only to the Philippines, but to the entire Southeast Asia and also Eastern Africa. And Dr. Roleda is uh, sharing his knowledge uh, across different countries where he, he travel and uh, teach people about those different species. So I will play the video. Tell me if you don't hear the sound. The Ukimatoid Repository for Sustainable Industry and Livelihood Enabling Community Empowerment or ear resilient. Can you hear the sound? Can we can, we can. Yes. Yes. Is a project that envisions the continuous effort of expanding the culture database of novel and commercial strains of eukematoids and economically important macroalgae. Since the seaweed farming success in 1970s, most of the commercially cultivated strains are more than 60 years old. Due to persistent clonal propagation of the crop, its overall productivity, carrageenan quality, and disease resistance have been observed to be gradually declining. These changes and challenges are also exacerbated by global climate change. Over the last decade, there is a global increase in demand in various industries for carrageenan. It is therefore imperative that studies focusing on selecting new superior strains with high carrageenan yield and quality satisfy the demands of various processing industries. These objectives can be achieved through the establishment and maintenance of seaweed seed banks. Here at the University of the Philippines, the in vitro gene bank was established at the Marine Science Institute the Seaweed Culture Laboratory and Gene Bank. The Gene Bank was originally established in year 2000 to house branch cultures of farmed or cultivated strains in the Philippines. All these collections date back as early as 2001, 2002, 2006, and 2009. Branch cultures of Tambalang and Giant from Zamboanga a local variety of Capafagos alvarezii, are more than 20 years old. Some of the common commercially farmed varieties housed in the gin bank are Tambalang, Giant, and Sakon. Our studies indicated a rich reservoir of unutilized wild genotypes in the Philippines that can be used in developing new cultivars with superior traits. UPMSI Seaweed Culture Laboratory and Genbank is the only institute in the eukimatoid farming countries in the tropics that is holding more than 500 unique strains or cultivars of eukimatoids that will be further expanded. Through the support of Global Seaweed Coalition-funded Secure Future Project, most of this have been genotyped and phenotypic characterization is continuing. DNA barcodes generated from our studies effectively expand the existing data bank of Kappa-Phyto sequences and can provide insights in elucidating the genetic diversity of Kappa-Phyto species in the country as well as neighboring countries of the Coral Triangle. In addition, we were also able to produce progeny from novel strains of Kappa-Phyto's alvarezii through in vitro spore germination from tetrasporic and corposporic individuals from the wild. The seed bank currently have more than 90 culture jars of sporlings produced from different parental plants. Culture handling and cleaning is an important and crucial aspect in maintaining the culture. These videos show how our culture stewards meticulously clean and gently handle the cultures with tender loving care. 
aside from the weekly cleaning of the cultures, we also prepare culture media, autoclave the seawater, and sterilize the glasswares before use. While the gene bank is expanding, one challenge is maintaining a steady supply of seawater which we currently source from our marine station in Bulinao, Pangasinan, which is a 7-hour drive from UP Marine Science Institute. Voucher specimen of the Yukimapai collections were also done and recorded in the database. Complementary to the in vitro gene bank, field or hatchery gene banks are best suited for the conservation of clonal crops. The UP Marine Science Institute Outdoor Land-Based Nursery, or OLBN, is situated in our marine station at the Bulinao Marine Laboratory in the coastal town of Bulinao, Pangasinan. A field or hatchery gene bank provides easy and ready access to the crop's genetic resources under continuous characterization, evaluation of their phenotypic traits such as growth, chemistry, and susceptibility to disease among others and their immediate utilization while the same material is conserved in in vitro gene bank in the form of branch cuttings. The outdoor land-based nursery houses collections from the wild, commercial strains from different farm localities in the Philippines, as well as tetrasporophyte and gametophyte individuals generated from spores. We are currently maintaining 124 glass tanks that contains a total of 98 unique individuals. Here, we showcase some of the commercial and novel strings that exhibit unique morphological expressions. Aside from the glass tank setup, we also maintain concrete tanks or raceways. The raceways are important for faster production of biomass which will be utilized for in situ studies or distribution to farmers for test planting. Consistent monitoring of plant health is important to prevent disease outbreaks or epiphyte infestation. Our hatchery stewards not only monitor plant health but also see to it that the hatchery water supply, filtration, and aeration systems are properly working. Oh, sorry. and are in good condition. Ambient light, temperature, and salinity are also monitored and recorded. Under hatchery conditions, we have recorded growth rates of the novel strains that range from 3 to 6 percent. These values are relatively comparable to the commercial strains that we have. After which, these fast-growing strains were further tested for carrageenan analysis. Moreover, through the field gene bank, we were able to conduct detailed phenotypic studies on growth and chemistry, such as carbohydrate and protein contents. However, more efforts will be done to assess the biochemical characteristics of different strains. In situ experiments were also conducted to test the growth performance of the different strains in the sea. This is a joint effort with the local government unit, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, and our partner NGO, Coast for Sea. In addition to these efforts, different culture techniques were also explored, including methods such as micropropagation and the application of biostimulants. Plant health is vital, and the field hatchery gene banks can be particularly sensitive to health issues such that regular monitoring and testing, coupled with application of disease control measures, is essential to maintain plants free of pests. It is therefore important to study and characterize the diseases to observe that plagues our plant cultures. Careful planning and field management are necessary to mitigate these biotic challenges. The only suitable techniques to preserve Yukimatoid cultivars is through in vitro banking and field gene banking. These facilities should remain freely accessible to breeders, allowing them to work on increasing production yield, disease resistance, environmental stress tolerance, 
and the chemical or nutritional qualities of these economically important seaweeds. With this, we thank the Global Seaweed Coalition for the continued support in these initiatives. So, Dr. Oleda, maybe you want to say a word before we move to the next presentation? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us the platform to present our work in the Philippines that, was, that has been uh, supported by uh, uh, Global Seaweed Coalition and previously Safe Seaweed Coalition. So we hope to continue this collaboration. And I think there are also some people in the audience that uh, I am collaborating with uh, and uh, also uh, providing the knowledge that we have gained here to other countries like Indonesia, Madagascar, and, and uh, yeah, somewhere else. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there will be questions. I already have some. So we will... Um... I uh, have some time for the Q&A before the 10-minute break. Um, so we had some questions in the chat, but I see, Adrian, you have your hand raised, so please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Melania. I, uh, I jumped on my button. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our, our presenters for the excellent presentation. I think this is uh, really inspiring and enriching to see all the things happening and all this great work. And actually, it was more two remarks to build on, on what uh, Laurie uh, brilliantly presented. The first one is, I think we uh, we have a great opportunity to make the science policy interface work in the context of, uh, of biobanking for macroalgae in Europe, given that uh, out of the political initiative called the Algae Initiative uh, announced by the European Commission and approved at the European Parliament, uh, out of the 23 policy actions, one is dedicated on biobanking, and there is a kind of uh, a call for collaboration with research to know what to do to uh, move biobanking to the next level. And so I think this uh, C-Strength project is uh, bringing a lot of answers and, uh, and, and will be uh, an excellent basis for discussion with, with policymakers. Uh, and so that would be, I think, a source of inspiration of uh, moving to action. We need to work hand in hand between uh, academia and, uh, and, and, uh, and government. So I think this is a great example. The second remark is uh, maybe more to put this Lori's presentation in the perspective of this workshop, there was this great slide where you presented uh, four options, you know, uh, by ecoregion, by taxon, by at EU level, and and just to tease you a bit about the the breakout session and the brainstorming, uh, it's almost like adding a fifth colon uh, and discussing what could be done at the global level and what could be the optimal. Uh, set up an infrastructure to foster collaboration and synergy at the global level. So I think picture this slide, just add a fifth colon, and this is the goal of, of today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so we have a question from Nicola Dyer um, the, in the chat. So does or could the crop trust cover seaweed banks also? So a question for Stephen Smith, I'm guessing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Molly. I mean, a, a good a good question never um and never seriously asked before, and um, I am happy to I mean happy to take this up. It is we are you know the crop trust works for you know plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, whatever that means. I mean, this could fall under uh, uh, our mandate, and um. I would say the the least the least what I would uh, suggest here to do perhaps we should um, w those who are interested uh, should put our heads together perhaps in a in a in a separate um, uh, in a separate let's exchange have a ninety minutes uh, initial discussion so ma many things of what uh, uh, Laurie just uh, mentioned so make very clear how how close the worlds are um the experts in uh, in seaweed and algae and uh, and uh, we with the land based agriculture are working on and um uh, i i would say in 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 uh, in theory yes of course we could let's say tweak our mandate a little bit to work on this 
Um, however, as honestly, we are by far currently do not yet have uh, the funding resources available to fulfill our man mandate on, uh, on uh, land-based uh, uh, gene banks completely. Um, I, I'm a bit reluctant to promise is too much. However, as said before, working closer together, identify crucial points where exchange of knowledge and so um, uh, could, could help mutually, both of us. Uh, I think that is that uh, uh, definitely is worth is worth the effort. And I very much would encourage this and uh, happy to be here part of a uh, member of this group and uh, happy to contribute to, to all kinds of uh, uh, cross uh, pollination <laughs> to say in, 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 this, in this area. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. Yes, I guess uh, funding is a challenge for all of the yeah. <laughs> biobanking. Um, I have a question from uh, Sergey Sergey Nuzdin, who is, who is awake really early today. Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Stefan, first I would like to thank you because you were our founder when we collected chickpea all over Fertile <laughs> Crescent in 2013 and 2014. So personal remark, after we got from that and we interacted a lot at that point with Hannes uh, Dempewolf, uh, who was our contact from Global Crop Trust, we actually communicated with him quite extensively about seaweed seed banking and even wrote you a couple of pages. And uh, my, my uh, humble evaluation would be that uh, the state of seed banking in uh, seaweeds, especially red algae, is critical. Yeah. Because with ocean warming and with biodiversity loss, as we saw uh, from beautiful presentation from Philippines, with some stocks propagated vegetatively for over 60 years, you are thinking about collapse of whole industry. So I think that the action must be instantaneous. Sincerely, 93 stocks is 10 times less than what we need to stage sensible breeding program. Yeah. And you know it better than I do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think if there is no more question, we since we are running a bit behind schedule, we can do a 10 minute break now. So I will ask you to come back at, uh, so in Europe it's 1.35, I'll let you translate to your, to your schedule uh, for presentation of uh, work in Madagascar and then uh, in the east and west coast of the US. So we will meet again in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So we'll start straight away our second session, um, going to travel in Africa and then um, in the US. Um, so I will share my screen once again. Okay, so we'll start uh, with a presentation of uh, Ocean Farmer. So Ocean Farmer is a leading uh, farming company in a uh, aquaculture farming company in Madagascar. So they have uh, an hybrid strategy of being a, a community community based farming. So one of their role is to deliver uh, LC accumulated strains to the farmer. Uh, for them to be able to uh, sustainable cult sust uh, cultivate those species in a sustainable way. So Ben Jennings, marine biologist and in charge of uh, research and development at Ocean Farmer, will um, introduce how they deliver this action. Ben, the floor is yours. Welcome to this short presentation on an initiative led by Ocean Farmers to develop local strains of seaweed for community farming. To give a brief overview, seaweed farming in Madagascar started in the 90s, limited to Capophycus and Eukema species. Today, a network of private seaweed farming companies exists, producing 3,500 metric tonne of dry seaweed a year for the Carrageenan market across five regions in the southwest and northeast. Production is relying on strains originated from the Philippines, mostly Capophycus alvarazi, variety Tambalang. 
The companies in this network engage in production from the ground level to the end client, implementing a holistic farming model focusing on positive socioeconomic and environmental impacts and sustainability. This takes place in partnership with coastal communities, conservation NGOs, national administration and international donors. Ocean Farmers is experiencing a number of challenges related to the lack of genetic diversity in the currently farmed non-native Tamberlang strain. This includes crops being highly vulnerable to epiphytes, other pathogens, at risk of widespread mortality in the face of climatic events, and plants being unable to adapt to seasonal variations in farming areas. But luckily, Madagascar is home to a high diversity of macroalgae, in particular eukematoid species. This has opened an opportunity to carry out fundamental work to catalogue, start biobanking and developing native strains for commercial community culture. These strains are expected to be more resilient and better adapted to local conditions while remaining commercially interest interesting. Increasing pressures on wild populations of eukematoids due to changing climatic conditions and unregulated wild collection means biodiversity assessment, improved understanding of the role of seaweeds and their conservation have become more crucial than ever. Fundamental studies of seaweeds in Madagascar are scarce, so ocean farmers and partners have started this early work, recognising the importance of to continue building capacity for biobanking to protect and sustainably develop coastal communities' natural capital. A pilot seed bank and hatchery was established in the southwest of Madagascar. Infrastructure includes an ambient hatchery area containing aquariums with pump flow through seawater supply. There's a basic laboratory for spore and germ in culture and an indoor nursery for juvenile culture and maintaining strains. An off-grid solar PV system and battery provide electricity for aeration of culture vessels and cooling and heating of indoor areas. There's also a backup diesel generator in case of power failure. The hatchery became operational in mid-2022 and we are pleased to host our research partner Dr Michael Willeda from the University of Philippines to help define early protocols and train technical staff on field and lab techniques. During that first year we also developed a better understanding of the timeframes and equipment required for each phase of our program. A classic plant breeding approach was taken for our work with Capophycus, which was made slightly more complex due to the triastic life cycle and novel techniques employed. A series of steps were carried out in the field, laboratory, hatchery and sea-based test site. Extensive fieldwork was conducted to identify wild populations and collection of fertile material. Plants were brought to the lab for barcoding and cataloguing and sporulation was induced from fertile material. Subsequently, spores were cultured to germling, juvenile and adult stages with basis, basic analysis of growth data. The continuously running project has built a solid foundation on the back of promising results, which is now supported by private bridging finance until further dedicated funding is secured. Results include growth of F1 generations under ambient hatchery conditions, and the highest performing cultivars have been outplanted at sea uh, for performance testing. Maturation of F1 generation has been observed under hatchery conditions, and there's efforts underway to achieve F2 through a process of sexual reproduction. Six locations were sampled in the southwest of Madagascar, with results indicating genetically diverse populations and potentially new species are present. A dedicated team of local field and hatchery staff have been trained. And Ocean Farmers really realises the requirement to include local academic institutions and the government as active partners in this project. This certainly requires dedicated funding. Alongside his core activities as a producer, Ocean Farmers contributes industry information and knowledge during technical working groups led by the government of Madagascar. This is to develop an inclusive biosecurity policy, ensuring sustainability of the sector and positive environmental, social and economic benefits are realised. It's been agreed not to import any new foreign genetic material. Therefore, government of Madagascar recon recognises the need to develop local native strains of Capophycus to reduce risks from climate change and improve biosecurity. Based on this, a network of seed banks has been included in the Na National Aquaculture Strategy. Ocean Farmers will continue this flagship initiative in the Western Indian Ocean and will share information and experiences for the benefit of all. Finally, we're grateful to all our network partners and look forward to all our network partners and look forward to the journey ahead in this program. 
thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, we it's good to see that uh, you are trying to sensitize the government for, uh, to more seed banks uh, in Africa. Um, so now we're going to change landscape and going back to um, to East uh, America first with uh, Dr. Mike Lomas, director of the National Center for Marine Algae and Microbiota and director of Bigelow Center for Algal Innovation. So we will uh, introduce uh, his different uh, seaweeds collection. Mike, over to you. Wonderful, thank you, Melanie. Thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so over the next few minutes, I'm gonna talk about um, you know, the collections we hold here, just so to bring everyone up to speed, because some of you may not know what uh, NCMA or the National Center for Marine Algae and Microbiota is. It's a U.S. Uh, algal germplasm. Um, it's been around for 43 years, plus or minus. Um, we serve a public mandate of being the home for wayward algal souls. So I forget which earlier talk uh, this morning um, said that, you know, they, um, you know, as funding runs out for other collections, private research collections and things like that, there's a facility that actually will bring them in and still make those resource, those research assets available. And so that's, that's the primary mission that, uh, that we hold. And so over the course of the last 40 years, we've been growing our germ algal germplasm collection by our own collections, as well as bringing in these sort of orphan collections. Um, and so we have roughly 2,500 microalgal species in our collection. And, but today I'm just gonna talk about the macroalgal side of the collection, which is about 1,400 strains plus or minus. So next slide, please. Excellent, thank you. So. Within the NCMA collection, um, there's there's this general algal collection. These are sort of the accumulation of those orphaned collections. Um, and so this is a lot of work from John West and other researchers like that. Um, I've got listed here the, the genera and the species, but you know there are 20 or so genera, 30 or so unique species, 146 physically distinct isolates all collected from around the world, but primarily the tropical domains, uh, a few from Northern Europe. Um, many of them are um, uh, cryopreserved. Some we keep in perpetual culture um, just because we haven't uh, gotten to the actual uh, cryopreservation uh, techniques for them yet as we sort of work through the collection. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, please, Melanie. Thanks. So. There's also within the NCMA macroalgal collection, two sub collections. And so one of them we call this Yukon NCMA collection. This is Charlie Yarish's uh, research collection. When he retired a couple of years ago, he transferred those holdings to NCMA to make sure that those assets continue to be available to the research community. And so here's just a, a quick description of those of that sub collection. It's about eight genera, 20 species, 250 or so isolates, again, from around the world, but now focus more heavily on sort of the, the northern subtropics and, and towards the uh, northern subpolar domains. You can go to the next slide, please, Melanie. In addition, there's also uh, another sub collection that's called the U the Huey Yukon NCMA sugar kelp uh, sub collection, and this is a sub collection created by Scott Lindell, who's on the the the, the webinar or the the conference this morning, and Charlie Arish, where they focused on one species, uh, Saccharina latissima, and collected a lot of uh, individual um, uh, uh, gametophytes. Male, both male and female, to try to get an idea of the that biodiversity within that one genus and species. Um, and so just to point out that a lot of that uh, phenotypic and genetic uh, characterization data is available on the sugarkelpbase.org data website. Go to the next one, please, Melanie. Wonderful. So, whoop, um, <laughs> there we go. Um, so I just want to take the rest of my time to take and talk about some of the things that we do within NCMA to try to tackle some of the challenges that have already been brought up today, like security, data, things of that nature. 
So within our collection, um, we have a number of uh, very detailed security protocols. Obviously, the first one is, is routinely keeping an eye on the organisms themselves, on the macroalgae themselves. So there's a lot of hand, hand and eyeball time on them to take and be mindful of potential pests or other invasives or, you know, sometimes microalgae get in there or grow up under particular conditions. You know, within all of our holdings, we have multiple redundant incubators at each temperatures um, so that if one were to fail, mechanically fail, we can move things around so that we don't lose strains. We have a number of different monitoring systems, one internal and one external to the physical laboratory itself, that when um, when there's a problem, when there's a failure of an incubator, whoever happens to be on, on call that day gets a call and says there's a problem, run to the lab and move things around. Um, and for some of our more critical or, or more valuable strains, we actually work with the US Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service to as a backup physical offsite um, uh, storage location of some of those important species. And um, we, we try as best we can to use cryopreservation as a more viable management strategy, right? We accept the fact that there's never going to be enough money to actually maintain these correctly. So if we can cryopreserve them, that's a way to use it as a management tool to minimize the actual people hours needed for that management. Can you go to the next slide, please? Here we go. Um, one of the things that we are working through is how do we try to aggregate the data to ensure that it's it's actually uh, accessible by the research community. Um, you know, there's for the Yukon Hui collections, a lot of that data exists within, as I said, the sugarkeltbase.org, where they have um, on our website, we have a lot of the metadata with those strains, prior preservation information, and some other parts of information. So even within those, the knowledge about them is split over two places. Um, you know, within our macroalgae collection, we're trying to work towards building out some of sort of some base level information, um, whether it be growth rates, whether it be nutrient contents or, you know, high biochemical class like protein, carbohydrate, lipids contributions as a baseline level to ensure usefulness, right? When people want to think about what they might use, what they might um, keep or not keep, we need at least some information to inform those decisions. And so that's our goal here is to try to create ultimately sort of this baseline knowledge. And then hopefully we can ingest other data to, uh, to improve um, the overall uh, knowledge value. You can go on to the next uh, slide, please, Melody. Um, you know, this is my common lobbying uh, on data is that because of the way the U.S. funding system works, every agency, it seems to have its own place it wants data to go. And therefore, it results in a very fractured data system within the U.S. And so if I want genetics data, I go here. If I want phenotype data, I go there. And, and it makes it really, really hard to actually then ingest because they all use different vocabularies and ontologies and et cetera, et cetera. So. You know, one of the goals that, that we are trying to lead within the U.S., and it was great to hear that first thing in the sea strains talk and the earlier talk, and, and we should definitely talk, <laughs> um, is how do we take and start to use similar vocabulary, similar ontology, so that actually databases are interoperable and therefore searchable by anyone globally. You know, we talk about global data and knowledge. How do we actually make it globally accessible? You could go on to the, the next uh, slide, please. Um, Another important thing to think about, um, for us anyway, because we are a, um, a germplasm uh, depository, we, we distribute these algal, algae globally to both academics and companies. And so IP ownership and access to the physical samples is really, really important for us. And so, you know, we use material transfer agreements when we work with companies. We don't when we use, work with academics. They generally have different goals and what they're using it for. We do uh, do strain licensing, um, you know, at least in the US. There's this this belief that I believe in that companies should actually help support public assets. They're making money. They should not make money off the back of academics. So how do we figure out access, but, you know, valued access? And so thinking about IP structure and things like that is really important. 
If you could go to the next one, please, Melanie. Um, and so also affiliated with this is now how we more effectively work with our national funding agencies, and one this might be relevant to, to Europe funding agencies. In the US, uh, the, our National Science Foundation is now working through what is called a sample management plan, whereby uh, germplasm collections such as ourselves, if we are expected to hold material that is isolated as part of a federally funded project, we can get access to, to financial dollars through that grant to actually help maintain it. Um, so there's we're starting to get better connection between the collection of the resources as well as the the support to maintain it. And I just throw in these last two bullets below because they're things that I'm involved with directly. The USDA's U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Genetic Resource Advisory Council is really pushing hard on how to integrate algae into the concept of a management system, much like our national plant germ uh, germ system or the crop diversity uh, trust that we talked heard about earlier. So, out in the U.S. anyway, algae is getting a a bigger seat at the table. Now we just got to figure out how to better integrate them by talking the same language. You can go on to the next slide. I think. Yep, that's it then. And Thank I think you I'm right very much. Thank you very much, Mike. You, you did it on time and very interesting. The question you raised about uh, the access and also the common vocabulary. I'm sure this will be discussed in the breakout rooms. Excellent. So we are introducing our last speakers, but not least, because he woke up at uh, 4 a.m. this morning to attend this workshop. So Dr. Sergei Nuzdin is uh, president and founder of Altacid Conservancy and professor of uh, biological science at the University of Southern California. So he will introduce his uh, collection of uh, Pacific kelp. Sergei, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie, for introducing and uh, great to speak after Mike, uh, this all wonderful preliminary information. Um, we are a very, very young organization. We are just a year and a half uh, old. And uh, if you switch to the next slide, we are dealing with kelps because there is a lot of interest now from federal to state California level. Uh, to farming and restoration of kelp. What you see on the right here is a map, for example, of bulk kelp. And those pink dots correspond to uh, bulk kelp populations that were present in 2008. And those brownish dots, which you see at the bottom, uh, is what remained uh, alive in 2019. So that is quite a dramatic change, and that illustrates why we should keep biodiversity of kelps now at Pacific coast. Because unless we preserve all that biodiversity now, all of that will be gone as a result of uh, global ocean warming. And next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we started just a year and a half ago, and uh, our seed bank is based on several sources, but most notably collaborations with the lab of Philippe Alberta uh, on microcystis periphera, giant kelp, and uh, that was funded by ARPA-E, and collaboration with the same lab and Pete Raimondi on neriocystis, which is bulk kelp, that was uh, funded by C. Grant and NOAA. So for those kelps, our collections are about 800 uh, genotypes. Uh, and for Neria sisters, for bulk kelp, it is approaching 1,500 when we receive full collection. But we also have um, other kelp species, including 20 samples of Luminaria farlovia that Mike Lomas kindly provided us with, and uh, more samples coming from historic collections of Mike Newshaw. So we are at about uh, 2,500 samples by now. And uh, what you see on the left is sporophyte stage, a big stage of kelp. And what we actually keep in the seed bank is um, gametophyte stage, so males and females. Next slide, please. So as a seed bank, we feel that we are based on four different pillars. And one pillar, of course, is seed banking. 
and we are actively working with uh, different uh, collectors and with different organizations who are sending us sporophylls, and we introduce them into collection. Every uh, collect every holdings that we have is a single spore origin, so every genotype is quite well defined. Um, we also have um, um, uh, linked collection of microbiome, similar to what Mike Lomas was speaking about. And by the way, Michael Marty Rivera, who is here on the photograph, he is also taking part in these meetings, so ask him questions as well. So that is our first pillar, seed banking. But our next uh, next pillar and next slide, it is distribution. And for distribution, what we mean is not only distributing seeds, but also distributing associated information. For example, for giant kelp, we have 600 genotypes completely sequenced. We have genome um, genome of giant kelp well assembled. Uh, we will and published. We will soon publish bulk kelp genome, and Philippe now is in the process of sequencing 100 stocks. We have genome selection models for growth rate, for carbon um, draw, for nitrogen draw, for thermal resilience. And this is exactly what we want to distribute. We want to distribute our approaches, our skills, and we really want to collaborate with uh, seed banking um, efforts around the world, making joint training, joint, um, um, joint databases. So our goal is to have by 2030, 12 keystone species collected to about 6,000 samples altogether and work with, uh, with local seed banks on started standardizing our approaches. So all of that comes from about 20 years of working with agric in agriculture field. So this is our major seed banking goals, but we also want to put it into context of interacting with actual stakeholders. And uh, the next uh, topic and the next slide is restoration effort. I, I started from the slide where you saw just how their kelp situation is on Pacific coast. And we don't want to restore ourselves, but we definitely have capacity of, um, of giving, of distributing seed bank material holdings to restoration agencies, making populations um, as uh, similar to their native state as we can, because we probably contain about 99% of biodiversity. And next one, we are working with, uh, could you go to the next slide? And we are also working with the farmers, because uh, we want to give them better seeds, we want the staging breeding programs from those genome selection models that we have. And the final slide, as I mentioned, we are very young organizations. So for now, it is uh, just a couple of people in our leadership. We uh, are lucky that we managed to attract uh, Michael Marty Riviera, who has been doing seed banking with Charlie Yarish for five years. Emily Aguirre joined us uh, as researcher who is doing microbiome research. Uh, we have we had many more interns uh, who are helping us with policy and licensing efforts, education and outreach, breeding models and everything. And we are just trying to fundraise and survive. It's tough time for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergei, for the presentation. Indeed, a very young organization in for funding. So um, I'm now going to open the second Q&A session uh, after those uh, three presentation. Um, I haven't seen a question in the chat except from uh, John Bolton who were asking about uh, um, irregular electricity in Africa, which I think was answered. Is there any other question uh, in the crowd? No? Okay, a question from Inka Bars. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Sergei. Very interesting, your talk. I'm questioning you. You are a company or an uh, or a governmental thing or so? How are you financed? Yeah, Inka, I was trying to convince my leaders of university to commit to Seed Bank as initiative for multiple years. And 
um, be because I think that it should not be an initiative of individual faculty, right? Because Seedbank should over overleave uh, individual faculty. And when I didn't get buy-in from them, we just established our own non-profit. Okay. And we are currently funded by Grantham Foundation. Um, so the, um, we want to keep all our stocks in public domain. And uh, the part of that, similar to what uh, other folks were saying, that companies are becoming interested in stock collections, and I feel that if we let them to fractionate everything, we will be stalling on progress. And if you have centralized collection from which they draw, it will become a very different scenery altogether. So this is what we see as our mission. We see keeping stocks in public domain, well curated, with sequence data, with linked genome selection models to to enable restoration and farming uh, uh, um, and farming folks mm -hmm. but so there there is the risk that it's not sustainable in case that financing is not continued grants absolutely 100 oh. percent okay we have, this is we have, a major problem okay yeah it is major problem i think that we have uh, enough money now to operate on business as usual for another year, what comes after that, I don't know. But uh, this is the best we can do, right? Because uh, in America, at least, how Michael was describing, it falls in the cracks between USDA, NOAA, NSF. Everybody is interested, but nobody has money. Mm. OK, thank you for your answer, Sergey. I have another question from Philippe Potin. Yeah, thank you for all the speakers. Uh, it was really very interesting talks. Uh, the, the, I have many questions, and probably some of them will be addressed during the, the working groups uh, coming soon, uh, especially uh, some uh, questions which may, may be related to some uh, ethical questions and uh, also the, um, related to the distribution of strains. Uh, of course, uh, the Inca already uh, asked a very important question about uh, the funding uh, models, which can uh, really uh, secure for, for the future of uh, the different initiatives uh, and how it could be uh, sustainable for, for this on the midterm. Um, of course, we are expecting that uh, the, 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 the seaweed industry will, will, will go uh, larger in, in, the, in, in the future and it could sustain a part of uh, our uh, efforts, but, uh, but that, that will be a very important question for, for the working groups. I have a specific question. I have seen that it was also a rise in the in the macro, uh, in the Q and A um, chat, uh, the, which is related to the the, secu um, the, the preservation of uh, the seaweed associated microbiota. Of course, it's a very important question for for for, for research at the moment. But there is many many groups uh, focusing on, on on seaweed microbiomes, and there is a, there are plenty of uh, initiative, but. Uh, from, from our, our, our own experience, and especially what we have done, for example, uh, on uh, Eclocarpus micro associated microbiota with uh, colleagues in, in Chile, uh, we have seen that um, the, the seaweed ma ma microbiome uh, will evolve very rapidly when you, you are starting to isolate uh, some uh, pure uh, strains of, uh, of, uh, of seaweeds, and uh, that you will uh, lose a lot of uh, the diversity. So what could be the strategy at Bigelow or in other institutes to, to, to preserve uh, um, uh, important as uh, part of the the, the, the the microbiota, which could come from from the wild when you are isolating seaweeds. Michael, maybe you you, Mike, yeah, you, you can answer. Yeah, I can start with that. So we do not currently store um, in a cryopreserved state or any state for that matter the microbiome associated with separate from the the algae. So they they evolve in whatever way they do with the algae as we maintain it. Um, you know, they will be, um, you know, whatever community is there will be cryopreserved when you cryopreserve the gametes. Um, I mean, this fundamentally, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but this fundamentally gets back to that capacity question, that funding question. Um, you know, there's lots of things we would really love to do, but, you know, there's it becomes very difficult to maintain a 
germplasm that has a vibrant research component and an honest to goodness distribution component. I mean, we distribute our collections to 40 countries around the world every year, you know, thousands of strains. And so I barely have enough time support for my curators just to handle the distribution and access side, let alone the research um, side of things. And so um, it does put everything on a razor's edge of what is of security and stability. But I agree, it would be great to to do those kind of things. Yeah, I would like my bit to answer this question as well. And uh, Scott Lindell is asking similar question over the chat. Um, we um, are trying to move to keeping gametophytes on agar plates. And on agar plates, um, antibiotics treatments are very efficient in terms of keeping microbiome out. And uh, we tested about 20 different antibiotics, and a couple of them seem to work. Um, but we also cultured about 25 different bacteria from gametophyte cultures out of 170 totals that we annotated as mugs in them. And uh, also collaborating with this, um, Matt Edwards in San Diego State University, who had separate NSF project on capturing microbiome all along the coast, Pacific coast. So we are kind of trying to move on that, but I am completely with Mike. It's just as much as you can do. Sorry, Inka, you want to react on this uh, discussion? No, this would be a new question. New question. Okay, go ahead. Also okay? Okay, of course. Yeah, okay. I have a question to Mike. And you just mentioned that you're distributing thousands of strains over the year to the whole world. How do you deal with Nagoya? Yeah, so the macroalgal strains you're distributing right now are within the US. We're trying to figure out what that looks like. The microalgal strains are global right now, although there's the occasional um, globally collected macroalgae that goes back to whence it came from. You know, off, we, you know, we distribute a fair number back to Australia because they were originally isolated from them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I mean, the Goya is a real issue. A lot of our strains are all collected uh, pre the grandfather date. So that helps, um, you know, if no. they're going, hmm? This does not fully help. I will comment. It doesn't fully it. help, but it does help. It doesn't uh -huh. make it harder, I would say. Um, you know, and, and and many of our distributions do come back from their original place of isolation, which also helps. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because we just, we are in the process. I have these very many cultures, also old ones from pre, I mean, from all over the world that were gathered by Klaus Lüning and then somehow came into my lab and so on. And we are now currently trying to get the green level of Nogoya. And we found out that even before Nagoya started, you have to take care that there was no other regulation, perhaps doing it. And this is extremely complicated. So, for example, we found out that Brazil, I mean, if you have a culture from Brazil, you can only share this with Brazilians again, and then only if they cooperate. Mm -hmm. So, I could keep this. I mean, I have this very important Laminaria abyssalis in my culture. I mean, this is just one clone, but I think it's extremely important. And so nobody will ab will be able to work with it. And uh, so we try to figure this out. And th this is extremely complicated. And in the end, I have to throw away a few clones because it will not be possible to work with them anymore. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Dealing with international treaties and regulations when we are scientists does make it a bit challenging, you know. I think we all get to become lawyers on the side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this question, we're going to close the Q&A. Um, we are going to do another break um, of 10 minutes. So I will ask you to come back at uh, 2.25 for Europe and let you translate for your time zone. And when we are back, we will split in the breakout rooms to brainstorm uh, what could uh, be the future of uh, the global sea with the biobanking together? Thank you very much and uh, meet you in 10 minutes. Okay, so we are now starting our third session, which is uh, more the brainstorming about the future of the sea with biobanking based on the, the presentation uh, we have received uh, before. 
So you will be um, automatically splitted and we are sent you to different groups. Um, and you will have 30 minutes to, to brainstorm on the topic you've been allocated to. And then we will come back in a plenary session and uh, each group will introduce in five minutes what was uh, the main uh, discussion uh, within uh, within its own groups. Um, so just to, I will give you the four different groups uh, so you know the topics and you don't overlap on topics of others. So the first one led by uh, Philippe Potin is on uh, protocols. So the objective of this group is to try to find two or three uh, protocols that can be harmonized uh, within uh, different seaweed banks globally. So uh, it's, a, it's a challenge and I hope you will succeed. The second group is on technology. So uh, how, how can global collaboration uh, reduce the cost and, uh, and spur innovation? So what are the latest uh, technology in place and what are the highest costs uh, to maintain a seaweed biobank today? The third group, um, led by Adrien Vincent, will be about uh, how do we shape this global platform and what are the pros and cons of having such a global platform? Uh, how it can look like? Is it uh, a new Svalbard Institute? Is it more uh, a collaborative network? So all of that you will discuss with Adrien. And the last one uh, is about ethics and governance. Uh, this one will be led by my colleague Azedin Badis uh, in the coalition. Uh, so what are the main principles uh, of, uh, of ethics and governance when it comes to a, such a global platform? Um, who can have access to this platform? So uh, you will discuss that in the last group. So Azedin, uh, if you can uh, split up in different groups now, uh, and then we'll regroup in, uh, in 30 minutes. Be prepared in the rooms. Are we all back? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azidin, for helping me with this technology. <laughs> so uh, now we have um, every group has a um, five minutes to recap what has been the discussion and the outcomes of the of his own session so i offer that we are doing in the uh, in the way that uh, we start with the protocols so philip's group then uh, i will do my group uh, adrian's group and then uh, the ethic and governance as the last so philip who in uh, your group is uh, willing to summarize the discussion I will summarize the discussion and I will let uh, two minutes for, 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 for completion by, by the colleagues. So we are, in fact, uh, in the group uh, representing different culture collections and uh, we had a lot of uh, curators of, uh, of culture collections uh, dealing with uh, all groups of uh, seaweeds, including, of course, uh, bronze seaweeds uh, and especially uh, kelp gametophytes or filamentous algae, which, uh, for which uh, we have a... Uh, very clear protocols which were established by uh, a long time ago by by some of our, our colleagues and which are shared or, or worldwide and which uh, allow to keep uh, female or male gametophytes for on a long term uh, of course uh, requiring a lot of uh, many tension for 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 media exchanges every year and uh, on the, these protocols are, are working well with uh, small scale collections but as soon as we have a large scale collection which will uh, be much uh, greater than uh, thousands of um, uh, of individuals, we will have uh, much more difficulties to keep them and it, will, it could really be very time consuming. So that we, we are expecting that in the group of uh, technologies, we, uh, some colleagues will uh, provide very interesting uh, suggestions for, for, for some robotization of uh, uh, some of the operations. But of course, when uh, we are dealing with uh, other groups of seaweeds, especially uh, uh, in red seaweed, except uh, for the, the Porphyra pyropia groups, we are dealing with uh, the only way of propagating uh, seaweeds by uh, just a piecing a pieces of um, of uh, uh, the a pieces of uh, of uh, of um, of the, the talus and which are in fact a way to, to propagate them uh, vegetatively and some of in, in some collections like for example in Halifax we have uh, 
a collection of uh, chondrous uh, gametophytes or sporophytes, which are very old and uh, which were isolated uh, more than 40 to 50 years ago, and which are still alive and which could be maintained. Of course, uh, the, 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 there is also a, a small uh, number of uh, strains which are preserved like that, but they, they could be uh, well preserved. And this is also the, the way for preserving the eucomoids. Uh, in the collection uh, in the Philippines or, or the tropical countries. Uh, but that is uh, becoming uh, sometimes uh, very difficult when you have to propagate them, uh, um, and, uh, especially to, um, as it is a case for, 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 for the, the Comorid uh, research at the moment to um, increase the, 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 the genetic diversity of uh, the strains which are available. So that requires a lot of uh, also um, many tensions. But the, the protocols for that are well established. Uh, but uh, for some uh, colleagues uh, which uh, may not be familiar with um, the protocols, uh, some of them are, are dispersed in different books. And uh, there were suggestions to really uh, create um, a library of uh, online library of uh, of uh, protocols and that it will be of course easy to to share the protocols and to adopt uh, also common protocols which will be selected on 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 the website so that will that was mainly for the the the, the main topic we have discussed which is uh, the the, the long-term maintenance of uh, of uh, the different phases of a life cycle of uh, of, of seaweeds which are quite complicated you you all know but we have also, of course discussed also about the, the potential of cryopreservation for for this long-term preservation uh, it is amenable for some uh, strains at the moment uh, and that uh, also the protocols could be easily shared uh, because they are established uh, in a uh, a lot of public programs and uh, on, uh, again the protocols are, uh, are available but sometimes they are not centralized and it will be important to centralize and also to share uh, the, the practices on the around the, the this technique because sometimes there, there is some uh, wrong experiments which were not reported and uh, and without uh, knowing about the failures of uh, others we can uh, continue to 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 conduct uh, experiments which will no longer be um, successful. So that will be important to share also what could be wrong in in, in some protocols and why it, it is not occurring. Uh, so I will not talk too much about that. I just let uh, my colleagues to complete uh, if they want, uh, just for doing one or two minutes. Nothing really to add. I think you summarized it. No, I think you summarized very well, Philip. <laughs> Well, su super. Thank you. Thank you to your group. Um, I am going to summarize the next group, which is on technologies. And actually, uh, interesting to see that it echo well what you have been discussed. Um, because we had the uh, owner of uh, kelp um, uh, collection and more owner of green and red seaweed collection. So we see there is a lot of uh, differences in the where the costs are coming from um, because we had the idea that the cost is to sustain the collection but indeed uh, for example for kelp uh, it just has to be uh, the, the water just need to be renewed twice a year so in this case cryopreservation is not uh, is not really relevant um, so that was uh, the, the first part of uh, the discussion uh, uh, where we see that uh, in some collection, the sampling and isolating characterization is the most costly and on others is uh, more uh, to sustain uh, the collection because the, the, it needs to be uh, uh, changed and maintained every week. But the main uh, conclusion of the group was that uh, it's not so much on uh, on the technology itself, but more also to share the knowledge on uh, on this technology. And um, since you are uh, all doing more or less the the same activity, it will be to have a database uh, where we could share um, on open open source the protocols and the expert in this protocol because we've seen there is expert in isolating kelp gametophyte in isolating ulva um, and so people can just uh, 
find on this platform uh, and, and database the protocol and the person expert in that field so that they don't have to to search uh, and to do this uh, same uh, work uh, once again. And uh, in our group, it has been raised also that sometimes we wait for protocol to be properly published. Um, and that can take time, one or two years. But actually, uh, just having a, a draft of the protocol and the person in charge of it on this database could be enough uh, to, to, to get in contact and to, and to work on, uh, on the technology. Uh, so I think that's it for my group. Um, the, likewise, the team, if you want to add something I've, I've, I haven't captured, uh, maybe um, one point that was raised was on uh, algal tissue culture. Um, is it uh, something that uh, other uh, uh, collection owner can be interested with, uh, protoplast and cell culture uh, to, to sustain the strain? That was a question raised. Well done, nothing to add. <laughs> Thank you. Philippe, you want to react to this? Yeah, I was just uh, wanting to, to, to know if you uh, had also some discussion about the technology, which may be related to some genotyping or phenotyping of the, the collection. So it was uh, shown by, by Sergei in the, uh, that uh, there, is, there, is, there is some tools for phenotyping which uh, could be shared. On, on, uh, and uh, we, we also experienced some... Uh, some development recently using uh, some uh, video uh, monitoring, which could be uh, also automatized uh, for, 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 for culture collections. Uh, and uh, we, were, we also discussed in our group about uh, the potential of uh, palm imaging, so fluores uh, chlorophyll fluorescence imaging, uh, which could be also interesting as a, a tool for phenotyping. So I don't know if you have time for, for discussing that in, in your group. No, we didn't uh, at the time to discuss this one. Thank In you. Kayu, just, one, yeah, just one remark. I mean, the barcoding uh, topic, we had no time. I wanted to add this, but then it, it ended already. I think this would be, I mean, this would be the future to barcode all, <clears throat> all culture collections. And if, but I mean, not everybody has the facility. So this could also be something that might be shareable or so. I even saw that there are publications, recent publications where just uh, the whole culture collection, I think it was from a Japanese ones. I mean, they just barcoded everything they had and then did some nice, <laughs> uh, yeah, did, just did a nice paper out of it, a fairly genetic one. So <clears throat> even some uh, scientific uh, uh, advancement could be could be done. And uh, the other, what was the other question? Oh, yeah, with the technique to what did you raise, Philip? Um, you asked another question. Oh, for fun. Of phenotyping? Phenotyping, yeah. I mean, Ronan said, I mean, he has an device, I mean, to phenotype his old one. I think he also gave it to you. So some knowledge is probably available, but I mean, something like a video or, or I mean, to show these devices that might be ideal. But this also then should go to, we should have a common platform, an open access platform and like, like a wiki or so. No? And where people also could, uh, I mean, like in these, where where people develop, uh, for example, R tools, I mean, we could develop then protocols, I mean, that, uh, and certainly this, some somebody has to take care of it mm. to do the curation. Mm. Renan, you, you want to react one minute because we I, need to Yeah, it's very, very time. fast. Uh, but the phenotyping, yes, uh, we uh, we helped uh, Philippe to set to set up in Roscoff, but uh, we also gave uh, all the codes and everything in our paper. And I just wanted to inform you that we massively improve the software, and um, and it allows as well to screen of uh, other species uh, with different colors, no problem. And uh, in that case, we created also a video to explain the user 
on the, the software as a graphical interface, which is working for Mac and Windows. So normally, everybody can use. Uh, it's not yet available, but we submit this week. So I will share if you are interested. In. It's just for information. Very interesting. You can share to the mail list of this group for sure. To start with, with before the platform exists. <laughs> uh, Adrian, you want to introduce what has been discussed in your group? Yeah, with pleasure. We had excellent discussions in my group. The, the only thing I can complain about is that nobody volunteered to do the report back. So here, here I am again. Uh, so in our group, the, the topic for discussion was about, uh, even if it was called global platform, the, the idea was really to brainstorm of uh, what kind of infrastructure could global coordination around biobanking look like? Uh, knowing that we more or less, we start today from uh, no global coordination with lots of local efforts. And the other extreme of the spectrum would be to have the equivalent of the, the Svalbard uh, seed vault. And what kind of in-between can we envision and could make sense for the seaweed world? So we discussed first a number of considerations to have in mind. And then uh, we started to explore what, what options could look like and how to make it work. In terms of preliminary considerations to have in mind, the first one is that uh, even though we are talking about global coordination, we need to recognize that already there is some continental cooperation that is building up. Uh, so, for instance, what we've seen with sea strains in Europe and the work of the European Commission at the European level. And another very good example was uh, ASEAN, um, with, with, uh, who is launching a, a break program under their Belt and Road Initiative around mariculture. Uh, which will connect and, and consolidate biobanking efforts in the ASEAN region. So one, one challenge slash opportunity here is uh, while celebrating and helping build up those regional hubs and, and knowledge platforms, uh, how can we build this kind of extra layer of international coordination, uh, acknowledging that uh, that makes a lot of things to be built in parallel. So this is something to have in mind. The second consideration is uh, I think the whole group uh, really appreciated the intervention from Stephen Schmidt, and uh, we, we still have some homework to do to better understand, benchmark, and analyze how it's being done on land and see what kind of inspiration we, we can take from there. And when I say inspiration, that could be in terms of best practices, typically who are they dealing with Nagoya or what kind of exception do they manage with Nagoya that we could apply uh, for seaweed. Uh, but it's also about identifying existing efforts which have this international reach where we could plug the, the seaweed infrastructure rather than having to build it from scratch. The third consideration is uh, about recognizing that even though there is a lot of value in sharing methodologies, protocol, best practices at the global level, uh, let's not forget about country specificities in terms of species, in terms of local context, policies, funders, commercial interests. And so um, we will have to, to juggle with this, this kind of tension between global, global coordination, but local specificities. So with those parameters in mind, um, I think some kind of model is emerging for global coordination, which, and I speak under the control of my group, but nobody sees like the hard brick and mortar, big infrastructure for a global seaweed bank. Uh, so it's more about a, a network or a consortium that can connect those continental efforts and when they are not in place, the country efforts, uh, but really in the spirit of, uh, of proactively sharing methodologies, protocols, best practices, technology. So everything that was discussed in the, the two former breakout groups, um, but still leaving a lot of freedom to operate for those continental efforts and national efforts and not, not creating an extra burden. And the other consideration we discussed is for whatever global effort we want to build. Of course, we have heard it again and again in the, in, the, in the workshop today. The name of the game is funding. So how can we mobilize funding to, to make this happen? And so, of course, one would expect that governments would fund uh, those kind of efforts. And uh, if it's global, uh, we will sure knock at the door of our friends of UNEP and other, uh, or FAO or other UN related organizations. But what we discussed is that uh, and I think we've heard that with Sergey, you have a great number of philanthropists and uh, who are looking at those kind of efforts and could be uh, could be interested. So all the WWF, TNC, uh, Bezos Earth Fund of this world, 
um, whatever we can package with the Global Civil Coalition, we should absolutely go to those guys. But importantly, we, we discussed at length China, which was a bit uh, the, the, the big uh, elephant in the room forgotten in this workshop. And the fact that in the way they do biobanking, it's uh, deeply intertwined with the industry. And so uh, that they are really uh, connecting well the industry and the biobanking efforts. And so in this period, we should also explore private sources of funding for this biobank this or this global biobank network or consolidation efforts, um, trying to not only <clears throat> stay in our uh, a bit more academic world, but see the connections and, and pitch the value add to those commercial players so we can get funding from them where they will see a direct interest, for instance, for selective breeding, for performance and resilience. But that could also generate some kind of co-funding for restoration efforts or purely uh, uh, purely conservation efforts. So with that, a, loop, a lot of food for thought and lots of, uh, of ideas to be further explored. But uh, thanks again to the group. Thank you very much for this recap, indeed. Uh complete in four different points and a source of funding to be found. Lucky you are a fundraiser manager on board. Uh, Azedin, uh, can you summarize as well before we conclude yeah. on this session? I will try to summarize a, a little bit. Uh, I will not be as good as Adrien because it's impressive uh, his uh, <laughs> capacities for synthesizing. So I almost uh, secured Mike or Jean-Paul to supplement what I say, but I will just start by saying that we started discussing uh, the Nagoya protocol. We started with Nagoya Impact, and uh, we had like a reality check uh, because the Nagoya uh, protocol is uh, implemented by some countries. It's not implemented by some countries. Some countries have their own access and benefit sharing protocol. And there's there's a big problem, and that we 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 issued this that problem of definition, and we uh, the question was raised during the plenary already with the, that plant question uh, that is kind of hindering the possibility to bridge land and sea. For example, if we were to have uh, um, organisms such as the uh, crop trust to uh, include seaweed, it would include a change in definition, and it's more and more complicated because it depends on the on the countries. So the idea here is that since Nagoya is in, is there's discrepancies, uh, there's it's twofold the, the form of action. We on one side we need to a little bit to become our own legislator and build our own ethical codes of conduct. And there are there was for, for example uh, a proposal for a good practice would be for scientific journals to systematically ask. Uh, publishing scientists to mention the origins of the strains they are using for research. For example, it could participate in systematizing uh, the, possibility of, the possibility of data collection. The idea essentially would be to bridge that schism of data between uh, aquatic and terrestrial. And again, so there are always all these, these definitions. Should seaweed be defined as plants? Uh, should they not? And having a, a good way of defining it. Uh, and uh, paving the way to, in this discussion, and because we are the Global Seaweed Coalition, we discussed that a body that could translate an international body, multi-stakeholder body uh, that could translate the Nagoya process uh, would be needed with a, uh, and allow a collaboration between stakeholders, all stakeholders of the seaweed value chain, including governments, civil societies, smallholders, academia, and I'm forgetting many things. And I will stop here to see if my colleagues can supplement because they can. I'm done. Um, a very good job, uh, as it is. <laughs> very good job. The thing, uh, the, what we could say, the story is not to ignore uh, Nagoya. We Nagoya is here, and we all have to make an effort. But there are some very big countries that are not didn't sign it, and there are a lot of people that ignore also in their own country the Nagoya. So. As we're adult and that we're 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 ethic, we have our own, own ethic. It might be interesting to say that we have our also code of conduct as people working in 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 the LG sector. Yep. There was a very good practical suggestion made about uh, journals routinely citing the source of the collections. So that could be that could enter the code of conduct. Okay. 
Okay, thank you very much to all these groups um, and, and for your interesting uh, insights. Uh, I think there is really a need for a common platform. Let's see if, uh, if we can make that happen uh, with this. Um, so now I'm going to leave the the floor and unless there is other reaction or question, maybe before we move uh, to the closing remarks from uh, EMBRC uh, with Ian Robert and then uh, the wrap up of Adrien. Any other remark or question from the group? Okay, perfect. So Ian, uh, if you can uh, give us the perspective from uh, your collection, uh, would be yeah. <clears throat> yeah okay thanks um for, we'll start by saying thanks a lot for organizing this i think it's a really interesting um uh way to go about things and and so so if you ask me to give a perspective from my collection from embrc for those who don't know embrc is a is a european marine biological resource center it's a european infrastructure and Europe in the last 10, 15 years has invested a lot uh, of uh, time and money in, in developing the uh, 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 distributed infrastructures um, in lots of different fields. And EMBRC is one example, and it kind of fits in with um, at least the continental level uh, networking that we've been talking about. So from my perspective, um, I'm, I've, I've been running a, a culture collection for, for quite a long time now, and uh, a culture collection which is historically um, uh, mainly uh, focusing on microorganisms, so microalgae and, and other microorganisms. And microorganism collections have existed for a, uh, a long time, more than a century. I think the, the earliest ones were in the early 1900s and i think it's interesting to see the 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 difference because you know now nowadays after more than a century there are several fairly well established um, national level microorganism collections um and we have very good uh, informal um uh, kind of collaborations and and interactions but uh, historically, there and there hasn't really been any kind of formal interactions, and, and particularly in terms of uh, st strategic interactions, um, that's kind of changed in in some sense in in the in in Europe at least with these research infrastructures. But even within these research infrastructures, it doesn't end up as a um, as a as a you know as comprehensive as you would like and for example EMBRC uh, we had the uh, the UK was involved in EMBRC and then isn't anymore thanks to Brexit and other things like that so even at that level that you know there there are you know uh, problems with the with the system but uh, so. I think it's it's a really interesting with with mac with seaweed collections, which I mean seaweed cultures have existed for some time, but it's relatively new that biobanks that the strains have been uh, integrated into <clears throat> into biobanks, and so I think it it makes a, a really big opportunity for um, you know not not doing what happened for microorganism collections, which ends up with the microorganism collections being um, kind of isolated and particularly in terms of long-term sustainability. Um, all of us, you know, spend a lot of time trying to find funding sources to keep our collections going. And so it's a really good opportunity. And I think there's, a, you know, there's a couple of, there's one really major difference between the microorganism and the seaweed collections. And that's that, um, you know, applications that are, uh, based on on microorganisms, they tend to be uh, almost all um, uh, involving closed systems. So you know, culturing microalgae in bioreactors and, and stuff like that. Whereas seaweed, we're talking mainly about um, applications which are going to 
happen in open systems, so in, in, in the environment. And there's a, a big issue, um, which we didn't really talk about today, but I think everyone is aware of, which is, uh, you know, the need not to introduce non-native species uh, into, into local environments. And I think that's a, probably a fundamental issue for the development of, of you know, a global network of, of seaweed biobanks. Um, um, and I think it, you know, it's a, it's, um, it's a constraint maybe, but it's also an opportunity. And that's where I think, you know, you can really justify, uh, having a model of, uh, based on, um, some kind of, uh, regional, um, biobanks. Uh, I thought the, the slide from Laurie was really interesting, which we didn't really spend much time on looking at whether uh, these biobanks could be based on uh, on tax taxa specific or national or international level the, the for me the national level is not a good model and that's what happens for for the for the microorganism collections and we still have issues uh with that so you know some kind of regional or international level um networks is is obviously a, a good way to go forward there's also another big difference i think between which we didn't really specify is, is for the seaweed biobanks there's there's this distinction between a biobank and a hatchery and um I mean, typically, historically, at least for the for the microorganism collections, we are just biobanks. We're not necessarily focused on the scale up and the you know the the actual application. Although some you know more and more these collections are going into that kind of thing, but it's not the basic focus. So I think that's you know somewhere something as well where we need to focus attention is. You know, when we're talking about biobanks, are we talking about integrating the hatchery part or having that as a, you know, a separate um, regional uh, thing, which is um, uh, where the, the, the strains are provided by a biobank to hatcheries on a regional level. And so that's, uh, I think all of that gives really interesting, uh, well, problems but also opportunities um i think it's uh with all the work that's been done by the seaweed coalition and others to promote uh the interest of seaweeds particularly as as um food feed food food stuffs but also in other applications i think that that kind of um um communication to Policymakers and the public is, is has has been really efficient, and so that creates opportunities. And I think just to summarise, I mean, what's been said, uh, Adrian said it much better than me. But I think you know there's opportunities and a, and a, a common uh, um, kind of motivation for sharing of protocols and technology. I think that's something where we can really uh, look into um ways to do this and um and then in terms of uh having a, a a global network uh whether it's continental um and looking into sustainability models and and a real big opportunity to you know get get as as was said the, the industry involved in this and and develop a model a, a kind of combined strategic model that never existed for you know the historical biobanks um and just finally you know the the, the crop trust um the, the possibility that they we could interact with them i think that's um that's a really really interesting possibility to to take inspiration from those and I think any, I don't think we can imagine that, you know, within a few years, we're going to have some global network, hyper efficient, but, uh, you know, any small steps we could make towards that to start with, I think would be um, a really good outcome of this kind of, uh, this kind of network. So that's my thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. I let uh, Adrien wrap up and uh, and conclude on on these thoughts. 
Yeah, th th thank you very much, I am indeed, and I'll try not to be too repetitive with, with your, your points, your very valid points. Also, I feel uh, honored and, and privileged, if not feeling a bit of an imposter uh, syndrome of an imposter during the concluding remarks or the, the wrap-up, given I think I might be the less knowledgeable on biobanking of this whole group. Uh, but that's maybe the segue for me to, to really first thank the speakers for all their excellent quality presentations and great contribution. It was really refreshing, inspiring, motivating to see uh, to see all of this great knowledge being built up, but also being communicated in a, in a clear and, and, uh, and understandable way, even for less experts. Um, so thank you very much. And especially thank you to our colleagues from uh, the US who woke up super early to join us and our colleagues from Asia who stayed awake late, late to stay with us. And uh, while I'm doing the thank you, I absolutely want to uh, to congratulate Melanie. So maybe a round of virtual applause with the little uh, the little icons for Melanie, who has been uh, organizing and mastering this whole workshop with the support from uh, Azedin and 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 Sophia and Celia. Um, maybe very quickly, three quick takeaways on my side from this workshop. The first one is, I think. Uh, Thanks to all your elements, we that will build and help build the narrative conveyed by the Global Seaweed Coalition about the importance, if not the criticality, of uh, of seaweed biobanking for uh, conservation uh, purposes and for commercial purposes. And I think that will really feed into this kind of burning platform narrative to convince funders to 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 bring more attention to to get more attention in the topic. The second takeaway is uh, listening to all of you. I think we should also celebrate the kind of momentum and the knowledge that is building up. And uh, this is really, again, energizing, motivating to see all these, these experts from all over the globe working on, on this topic and, and pushing hard, even if uh, we felt for me it was not always easy. Uh, but so that's great. And maybe my last takeaway is uh, uh, all those different initiatives that we want to celebrate uh, are great, but even better, I heard from all of you a real desire for collaboration and coordination and, and, and uh, accepting maybe to adapt a bit the way you are working to make it more streamlined and harmonized and standardized. Uh, so, so there is a global outcome that is beneficial to everybody. And those who are a bit more advanced are willing to share. Those who are less advanced are willing to learn. Uh, and so I think this is also a very positive, uh, positive dynamics that we, we want to, to celebrate. Uh, now, in terms of next steps, uh, what, what what will happen after these workshops? To be honest, it's uh, what I'm going to share with you is uh, is a bit uh, thinking out loud and, and, and what comes top to my mind. But uh, first of all, what I can commit to is that given we have done a recording of this meeting, the recording will be made available. Now, will there be written minutes uh, that the team will decide? <laughs> if on top of the recording, there will be written minutes. Okay, Melanie, great. So that will be shared with you. Uh, next to that, uh, with this record, minutes and recording and kind of potential next steps will be shared with the scientific council of the GSC to identify jointly how we want to push this further and what could be our priorities uh, to support further collaborations. And then, you know, if we want to put a bit of uh, of pressure in the system, I think we it's always good to have a bit of a deadline. And I was checking before doing this intervention the date of the next International Seaweed Symposium, which is May 2025. Uh, and I think that this group could be reconvening on a more or less regular basis. I don't want to overload you, but maybe every uh, four to six months to continue the discussion and, and the progress with, we could agree on, on the goal to have something really to present, uh, hopefully with some initial funding being secured by the International Seaweed Symposium, which I think would be a great place to, to announce uh, such a, such a new global network or global initiative on biobanking. So I hope you agree with that. Yeah, I'm not saying it's a, it's a set in stone, but that could be an idea to put some uh, some stimulus in the system and to have a deadline to, to target. Uh, my last comment is uh, I've, I've heard from some of you that they wanted to reconnect on a one-to-one -one basis. So I really hope that all of you did not know each other yet. And so that you have uh, discovered new profiles, new people, and I really encourage you to connect also to follow up on a, on a bilateral basis because I'm sure without waiting for the large group, there, 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 there are lots of one-to-one uh, -one discussions that can be fruitful uh, in, the, in the coming weeks and months. So with that, thank you everybody again for your time, energy, and great insights. And, uh, 
And so if I don't see any big red flag, uh, we will uh, offer a date to reconvene uh, later this year. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you.